My name is Aparva Sakti, and I'm a research scientist with the MIT Energy Initiative. My background is in engineering and public policy, so I've looked at energy storage system design and optimization, and lately I've been focusing on the different applications and what sort of business cases you can make. Uh, so, yeah, as Magnus pointed out, this is a very long uh, slide name, particularly because I'll touch on two different case studies that we are running. Uh, it's still in the initial stages of, uh, I mean, finishing up this study. So any comments or feedback that you might have would be very well appreciated. And we are still at a point where we can change the direction a little bit. For the first case study, what I'll uh, talk about is, let's say you are an investor and you want to uh, invest in an energy storage system. Nowadays, it's increasingly uh, lithium ion batteries and different flavors of that when it comes to the chemistries. So let's say you invest in a one megawatt hour lithium ion battery. What exactly does that mean? I mean, you can go with the fact that it's the maximum power for a certain duration of the time, but do you actually end up getting one megawatt hour? Or the actual usable capacity is significantly lower than what uh, the nameplate capacity is? And how might that change, <clears throat> change the profitability of the system? On top of that, there are regulations, market policies, and whatnot, which I will not go into, but that sort of things will impact as well. For instance, is the price signal varying every five minutes, or is, is it varying every 60 minutes? Uh, and then there are other aspects as well with regards to in optimization models. How are you representing these batteries? Is it a fixed efficiency? Is it a fixed power limit? Or is it varying as a function of the state of charge? So these are some of the things that I'll touch on in the first case study. And for the second case study, what we are trying to look at is we have generator level data across the United States. And what we are trying to see is that sometimes you have gas turbines running or spinning to be able to provide the spinning reserve service. What if you were to have a hybrid system where the battery would take up the initial uh, ramp up and the, and the, the turbine will not have to spend uh, money in fuel-related costs or startup-related uh, costs. So that sort of a trade-off is something that we are investigating as well. So I have to warn you, unlike Dr. Zan's presentation, I do not have a whole lot of equations. So I was hoping that we can sort of discuss the general uh, structure that I have, and I'm happy to answer any detailed questions that you have. This is sort of uh, laying out the ground uh, a little bit. Uh, when you look, I mean, there are 98% of energy storage is almost uh, pumped hydro, and then you have other technologies as well. But lately, when you look into advanced energy storage deployment, you see electrochemical energy storage coming up quite a bit. And within that space, lithium-ion batteries are playing a dominant role. And within lithium-ion batteries, as you might know, Panasonic slash Tesla has their own chemistry. Uh, then you have Sanyo and then LG Chem. Different companies are uh, providing our different companies are going with a different sort of uh, chemistry of their choice. So how do, you, how do you go about understanding the relative trade-offs across these chemistries? And if you were to invest, how, how, how would you make that decision? So we are actually working, even though in the title it might say offshore wind, we are working with a company helping them come up with a decision-making framework to help them uh, go ahead and figure out what technology, what chemistry would make sense. In this presentation, I will not touch a whole lot on offshore, uh, offshore wind. But happy to answer questions. So this just shows the distribution across, I mean, uh, different power levels and the duration. This, again, ties back to when you have a one megawatt hour battery system, let's say, that you invested in, how much can you actually cycle it? What sort of profitability window are you looking at? And this just gives you an idea of all the different projects that are out there. Almost 90% of them are five hours or less duration. And then the, the, the trend of continuing uh, investment in uh, electrochemical energy storage system is happening. So this sort of uh, helps us uh, put into context as to what I'm going to show in the next few slides. All right, so this is what I was talking about with different vendors having different chemistries. So when you are out there, it's not just one chemistry that you can go with. There are multiple ones, starting with Energizer, Panasonic, Tesla, A123 systems. And nowadays, there's a bit of an increasing push towards chemistries that are perhaps in low cobalt content, because uh, what you see over here is the spike that you have recently seen. This is from the London Metal Exchange, and that just shows how the prices have, in some uh, cases, skyrocketed. Another thing with cobalt also is that around 50% of the production happens in uh, DRC. 
which has other uh, geopolitical uh, connotations there as well. With that, I wanted to start off with the initial framing that uh, you have a battery. Now, let's say the 100% nameplate capacity is about one megawatt hour. How much of that is useful? How can you cycle that? Some of these studies that are out there have shown that, I mean, especially in the case of the uh, wind developer that we are working on from Norway, <laughs> uh, we know that they have a battery and that the battery initially came with uh, the warranty that, all right, we are going to provide you with the warranty, but you can only cycle it from 30% state of charge up to 85% state of charge. That directly brings down your uh, cyclable capacity by half. This has implications beyond the uh, attractiveness of the battery itself. For instance, the other day I was in a flow battery conference and they were trying to figure out whether flow battery will have a viable case in the future. When you are comparing different technology costs with that of lithium ion batteries, you'll have to look into the systems level cost, number one, of which the battery pack perhaps can be half of the total costs. And then beyond that, what is the total cyclable, uh, or what is the amount of capacity that you can actually use? And then we have done some studies that shows when you look at power as a function of the state of charge, the efficiency as a function of the power charging and discharging that you do, that takes about 10% hit on the estimation of the revenues. And then on top of that, there are degradation-related issues that studies have shown could be up to 46%. And then the uh, impact of price signal. And then you could say that the net revenue that you're going to get out of is a function of all of these. These don't essentially stack up. This is not a hard and fast sort of a graph that will apply in every case, but this is merely representative to show, starting from a battery of one megawatt hour, what sort of uh, value can, you can get out of this. So this is what I was saying. Before we did our study, we saw that different power systems model, including some of the dispatch models that are out there, such as Plexos, Aurora, and whatnot, they look at batteries as if you can get the same power uh, limit, the maximum power limit across different states of charge, the losses are the same, but that is not the case. So we looked at, uh, we used empirical data from uh, different battery discharges along with uh, manufacturer specification sheets or data from manufacturer spec sheets, as well as fundamental physics uh, or uh, the physical behavior of these cells. And we came up for, for an NMC chemistry Given a, uh, given a specific efficiency or overall efficiency, what the power limit would look like as a function of state of charge. And then you have the losses for different states of charge as a function of the power. The reason we did that was this, was this has not been done before and we wanted to even see, does this make a difference? Should we even care or is it just completely fine that you're uh, representing batteries in a way that is not actually representative of their physical behavior? And then, we, that, that was when we saw that it could make a difference of around 10%. The limitation of the previous study that I just showed was that we did not look into a, uh, take into consideration the degradation of these cells. So in this current effort, what we are trying to do is build up on that and look across different chemistries. And we are starting off with three. And we are also accounting for the degradation of these cells. It's, we are starting. Uh, the trade-off often is how much complicated you want your model to be, and is it worth the additional time that uh, the model will take to solve. So we are trying to figure that out. And these are some of the differences that you see. A lot of you who work with batteries might have come across these sorts of plots. I mean, this is the open circuit voltage pretty much, and then uh, this is how the power compares across the different uh, batteries. And then we are going with the linear degradation model, and we have some price numbers based on the latest projections as well as our in-house cost models. And then these are, of course, subject to sensitivity analysis because as with any given model, you have to do a validation studies and answer the question, why should someone believe those numbers? So in that effort, another thing that we are also doing is that we have these models, but nothing beats actually testing these cells to see whether our models match up to uh, the physical behavior. So we have a high, I mean, high precision kilometer of sorts. I mean, this was, this was developed from the lab of Jeff Dunn, who works with Tesla Motors, and uh, their pitch is this is unlike battery tests, which can go in up to years. This one, because of its high precision, you can 
tell whether there's degradation going on after just four or five uh, cycles. That would give you an idea of the parasitic reactions that might be happening and how you can relate that to the life of the battery. So we are pushing ahead with that as well. With, with that, I will wrap up this case study and some of the results that we see. The goal is, the way we started off doing this is we wanted to uh, compare the trade-offs for offshore wind applications across different ISOs in the US, uh, taking into account their day-ahead market prices for a year, and essentially optimize the battery system. These are initial results, and we see, no surprises, batteries uh, are still pretty expensive. And we see that in the case of no battery, what difference it makes with just the energy uh, market. So it's essentially just provide, using the day-ahead prices on a, for an entire year to calculate this. And then we see across the different chemistries, what difference does it make? And we see around perhaps a 3% addition on the revenue uh, on the energy market itself. The capacity market is where we think the value would uh, likely be. And we see how, uh, how, how uh, that makes a difference. And, Across these two chemistries, one is a Tesla Panasonic, and the other one I think is LG Chem, if I'm not forgetting. And then this one is the A123 systems that was spun out of here at, uh, spun out here at MIT. But this is a high, higher power battery, but you see that the net revenue that you get out of these systems is lower in this case. Once again, uh, perhaps you don't need to care as much about the uh, differences across the chemistries as opposed to what sort of uh, break-even prices that these numbers uh, point towards, which is pretty low when, you, when it comes to just the energy market. But adding the capacity market could change the uh, attractiveness of, of, of batteries in this context. This is once again a price taker model, so it does not look into as you have increasing penetration of batteries into the system, how it might impact prices, but it would still give an investor who's looking into buying that uh, marginal energy storage unit, how much of a, uh, how much uh, potential uh, he or she has uh, to sort of uh, generate appropriate levels of revenue. And then we, are, we have done this analysis for different uh, ISOs as well, but it's still in its initial stages that I did not want to show it up here because we'll have to go through validation and make sure that the numbers uh, make sense are not complete BS. Uh, all right, so this is mostly what we have for the first case study. Uh, and happy to take questions, but let's quickly look into the second one. Yeah, so the second case study that I said uh, was essentially looking at a hybrid system that operates a gas turbine together with an energy storage unit to see whether there's benefit from fuel cost savings, startup costs, and uh, provision of attractive services like spinning reserves, which uh, we haven't gotten to in this presentation, but that's something that we are going to go do in the future. There have been uh, reports that are out there which mention these sorts of uh, uh, business cases, but they have left it, up, uh, left it out to sort of something that uh, someone can uh, do, do research on to figure out whether there's any potential there. And we thought, let's pick it up from there and see if there's any case there. I have just two or three more slides uh, for those of you yawning. Uh, but essentially what this shows is across the US, uh, we have generator data. I mean, this is just for California, and we did just to do a bookend analysis uh, for, the, uh, for the initial uh, or for the outset. We picked two generators. One was a low startup and use, and the other was a high startups and use. The idea was to bookend as to how much savings you might have. And this just gives you an idea what the actual generator uh, looked like. The idea here was, all right, you have the generator output. We haven't started looking into other services, just the output of the generators, let's say, in 2017. And what we wanted to do is you have this output data. Now let's bring in a battery. Let's figure out what the efficient heat rate is. Let's run those generators as that efficient heat rate to see, having a battery, what difference it would make with regards to fuel savings. That was it. It was a very simple optimization exercise that we wanted to do. Our initial results showed that, uh, I mean, this just shows the number of startups. Uh, this is the base case and the hybrid. Base essentially means that whatever the generator was operating in, the hybrid case is where we have the battery as well. And this is the low, this, this is a low capacity factor turbine. This is a high capacity factor turbine. And what this one is showing is that the startups have gone down from 23 to 14, 
381 to 117, which makes, I mean, that is what you expect because you're trying to not use the turbine as much. And this is essentially the cost savings, and you see the cost savings from fuel as well as startup. And not surprisingly enough, it's in the case of the high uh, capacity factor turbines where you see there's room for uh, savings up in the order of around 250K. Now that comes down to around $25 a kilowatt hour. We are still analyzing to figure out if there is a business case, and this will likely change as you get into uh, more attractive services such as spinning reserves. Finally, some key takeaways. Um, the entire premise of the research, uh, or one of the case studies, was batteries are not represented properly. What difference does it make? You have all these different chemistries. How do you go about understanding, or more accurately, uh, getting a handle on the economic potential of these chemistries? And then this could be applied to beyond, beyond lithium ion batteries when you're uh, trying to figure out the trade-offs across other technology. And then we see what sort of difference it makes across uh, the, some of the results were for New York ISO, and then taking it further to other ISOs and across different chemistries, what difference it makes. And then the hybrid systems analysis where uh, initial results show lower, uh, lower returns, but we are yet to look at some of the more attractive cases which would uh, require more work in the sense that we will have to have a production model uh, which, which, is, uh, which is going to take a little bit of time. So we are hoping that in the next two or three months we are going to be able to wrap up uh, in a couple of papers, but that's mostly what I had to say. I hope I stuck to my time and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. have the approach set, I mean, because what we are doing is, let's just run these three cases. Let's see what our get feedback, let's see if the approach makes sense, and then replicate it across all the generators. Because we have data that shows uh, with more wind or more, more solar coming into the systems, how are these generators cycling? Because we have seen that they are running at uh, capacity factors or uh, heat rates, which are which lead to more emissions than, uh, yeah, than what you expect. That's the next question I wanted to ask you, and you say, not to worry, nicely. In situations, say, in California, with, uh, you know, you have a lot of air conditioning below a certain time of the year, okay? It wouldn't be so much a heating demand, but you have the air conditioning in when it's very, very warm. And you look at the spinning reserve issues. In terms of, say, um, the booking and the shipping of gas for the company that would be running these plants, has the booking and the shipping of the gas factors been taken into account? Because they have to book and ship their gas. They're planning ahead, they're going to go. Right, right. And we don't want to have sort of a, an end on experience again. So I'm just wondering, you know, have you considered that in your model? That, all, because that affects the, right. the, the cost. Yes, uh, true. I mean, we haven't gotten that far as to, uh, that, that almost seems like level two uh, after this as to how do these uh, folks procure the gas and what sort of contract that they have. I think that would be. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that would be very useful to keep in mind as we get towards. All right, now we have these sorts of, or we understand how the field looks like. What impact will it uh, will if they were to opt for a uh, battery now? What impact will it have with their gas supply, and how would they go about sourcing that? So that that's definitely something. Yeah, I, uh, I did an IPT paper that I did there a few years ago that looked at that. Okay. And just the gas power model. 
All right. Yeah, happy to happy to uh, chat more with you. Yeah, quick question from uh, numbers, number ten, thirteen. So, so the numbers of uh, net revenues. Those sixty-one numbers additional net revenue if you use batteries. Is that the case? No, no, no. So this is as you see. Uh, this can be. Uh, we came up with the uh, this plot last night. Okay. So that's why uh, it's a little fresh off the press. But this is what you have here is, this is the revenue from when you ha don't have the battery. OK? Or, or this is the green one. The green that's one, 94, right? Right. So you don't that's have revenue. That's 94. the. 94. If you add battery, it becomes 61, 60, 40. Right, 90. because you are sort of taking, uh, you are taking a hit with the cost of the battery. The increase, right. the increase is, uh, marginal uh, when you see, oh yeah, so this is the energy and arbitrage, and this is the capacity value, all right? And this is the sum of these two. What you see over here, once you have added from the no battery case to an, an MC battery, we see around a 3% increase in the energy together with arbitrage revenue. And then you have the capacity value that increases, but you are taking a hit with regards to the cost of the battery and the capacity value. It's, it's, it's the two orange, it's the two orange wings at the top. The two, sorry. It's the two ones with the nine wings. Yeah, 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 these two. So if we only look at the net revenue, right? Uh -huh. You're saying that it's a bad idea at that. Yes, uh, that, that was, that was our idea. Saying, that that you, you'd end up being uh, better off. I mean, but then the other side is, yeah, something like this would make sense when you have mandates then you would want to deploy those. But in general, what we are so looking at is bad idea. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> OK, that's fine. But that's, I just want no, to yeah, oh, okay. you, you are saying three person increase something that, but I see decrease, right? But there is actually, you know, there's very few markets in the world where storage makes any economic sense. Mm -hmm. The only place actually where it seems to work is Japan. You know, and the only thing that works at the moment that makes any financial sense is pumped hydro. The only reason that is because it's paid off over already over 50 years. All right, so, yeah. So the numbers don't look at the time. Uh, we'll